Good morning. It is good to be in worship with all of you gathered here. Those of you joining us online this morning, my name is Melissa Danielson. I'm the assistant pastor here at East Main Church, and um, it's my joy to welcome you this morning. As we begin our, or prepare for worship this morning, um, I just want to acknowledge that we often come to worship um, from so many different places. Some of us are coming from a, a place of uh, feeling well rested this morning and you had a good breakfast and you've kind of been just enjoying life this morning. Um, others of you today, it might have been really hard to get here and your hearts are feeling really heavy for one reason or another, or you're feeling burdened or discouraged by the difficulties of life and the brokenness of the world. Um, God can handle both extremes and everything in the middle. And so I just want to encourage you to come as you are this morning um, with your joys and your sorrows to remember that life is hard, yes, but God is good. And that is why we can gather together for worship to encourage one another with that truth um, in the midst of the truth that life is hard. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm chapter 9, verses 1 and 2 and 7 to 11. And as you are able, I invite you to stand for our call to worship. I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing the praises of your name, O Most High. The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He rules the world in righteousness and judges the people with equity. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises of the Lord enthroned in Zion. Proclaim among the nations what he has done. Let us do that this morning through our opening hymn. Please remain standing.
You may be seated. Welcome again. Um, just a few notes. Uh, senior Pastor Bill Hoffman continues to enjoy some sabbatical time. He will be returning at the end of August. And um, in the meantime, we've been really grateful to have Don Opitz and Dave Valentine, who will be preaching the third installment of his Joshua series for us this morning. We're grateful for you guys and your willingness to help lead and teach through the summer. We're also super excited to have the choir singing this morning. And um, if you feel inspired by the music today and are interested, please see Danny um, for more information about how to get involved with the choir or other music ministries here at our church. One thing we do want to make people aware of is that um, we are hosting a blood drive here on August 5th. If that's something that you would be able to be a part of, um, the information on how you can get involved, um, you can schedule it there at their website. A time, everything is scheduled, so there isn't a lot of... Uh, congestion here. It's really well done. Um, and many of you may know, or perhaps you don't, that there really is a shortage um, around the country right now. And if that's something that you are able to do, um, it would be a gift of life that could be really, uh, truly make a difference to someone else. So we encourage you as you're able to participate in that. Um, if you are interested in being a part of the welcome team, which should sound like fun because it is, <laughs> um, I would love for you to join me and uh, a number of other people in Fellowship Hall Wednesday evening at a 7 p.m. short meeting, desserts, extra incentive. Um, we're going to talk about what it looks like to truly be a welcoming church, how this relates to our mission. We're looking people to, for people to fill a monthly role of greeters, um, hospitality team, and what I'm calling seaters, formerly known as ushers. <laughs> Um, but you'll have a little bit of an expanded role for that. So if that's something that you're like, hmm, maybe that would be fun, or you'd just like to learn more about it, join us here, 7 p.m. Wednesday evening. Um, as always, thanks for giving, because your giving is what makes ministry at our church possible um, here in our community and also around the world. Um, we've moved our mission map, so when you go and enjoy some fellowship time after worship, take a minute to take a peek at the map. Um, you'll catch a little bit about some of the places around the world where your giving is at work, um, and it changes regularly, so stop by and check it out. Um, we do seek to be a church that's fully engaged in our community and around the world, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ in ways that um, bring life to the world. And while we all know this in our heads, <laughs> a lot of times living it out, um, we kind of fall short. And that's where the role of confession comes um, for those of us who are Christian. Um, just being able to come before God and saying, I know what I should be, um, and I know how I've fallen short. So help me to, uh, to grow by your strength. And that's why we incorporate confession as part of our worship each week. And so at this time, I invite you to turn and pray our prayer of confession with me. Almighty and merciful God, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare those who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent according to your promises declared to the world in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O merciful God, for his sake, that we may live a holy, just, and humble life to the glory of your holy name. Please join me now in a few moments of silent, prayerful confession before God.
Oh God, the prayer we just prayed says it so well. We have failed to do those things that we ought to have done, and we have failed to not do those things we ought not to have done. Some of those ways are very clear to us in hindsight. Some of them we're still wrestling with. For God, failure is so unpleasant. And yet, without confessing how we have failed, we are unable to receive your forgiveness. So God, thank you that we can come before you as we fully are, faults and failures, hopes and aspirations, efforts, but also grace. Thank you that in Jesus Christ, you have forgiven us when we confess. And thank you that by your Holy Spirit, we can continue to receive the grace we need to continue to grow, to become like our Savior Christ. Lord, today we're aware not just of our own brokenness, but of the brokenness of the world. We're aware of ways that just even over this past week, um, we have seen people we know and love struggle and suffer. We ourselves have struggled and suffered. We have seen images and pictures of things on the news, both about our nation and the world that trouble and grieve us deeply. We lift up today, God, those places where there is hunger and war, where there is disease and a lack of clean water. We pray for people who are struggling because of oppression and injustice, corruption, even natural disasters, God. We pray, God, for those places where greed just seems to be the way it is, and we desperately want a better way. God, we want your kingdom way to be the way we, in which we walk and the way in which the world runs. And yet, God, you delight in the, in the greatness of this struggle to work in small mustard seed sized ways our hearts. And so as your people gathered here today, we ask that you would grow in us the courage and the conviction, the wisdom and the clarity to truly be a people and ambassadors, kingdom builders, both here and around the world. We pray for our brothers and sisters around the world whose witness is costly. We pray for strength and courage and for your Holy Spirit to protect them, guide them, and to be changing hearts. And we pray, God, for our nation, for all of the many issues and struggles that we are facing, even as we pray for our community and our families. God, sometimes it's easy to get confused. Life is indeed hard, for we live in a broken world, but you are good. Christ is our hope, and the Holy Spirit, that same power at, that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, is at work in us, seeking to resurrect us to the fullness of life that he came to bring, not just for our own sakes, but for the sake of the world you so love. And so we pray all of this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us when we pray together to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
two single verses in chapter 24. And we're going to underscore the truth that life is a series of decisions. The sum of all the decisions you make actually is what creates your life. And one of my joys as a college professor for the last 40 years has been dealing with young people at that exciting time of their life where they're facing the big choices. What shall I be? What shall I do? Whom shall I marry? And most particularly as a faculty advisor, what shall my major be? Now, some of those sessions were harder and easier than others. Uh, It turns out in computer science, calculus two can be a great dividing rock in your career path. But I remember in particular, one young lady who came to me the first semester of her senior year, so it's her seventh semester, and I was her eighth academic advisor which means in seven semesters, she had gone through eight different academic departments. And I looked at her transcript and there were, there were no computer courses in it. And I looked at it and said, do you wanna be a computer science major? And she said, no. And I said, well, what are you doing here? And she goes, my last advisor told me to come talk to you. And I said, well, what would you like to do with your life? She goes, I don't know. Um, what are your passions? What, what puts the juice in you? What puts the wind in your sails? She goes, I don't know. I said, well, what, what do you like to study? She goes, I don't know. Just, just look, what am I close to? I'm supposed to graduate next semester. But make something out of it. What, what am I supposed to do? And I said, it doesn't work like that. And she and I went back and forth for 10 or 15 minutes, me trying to say, what are your passions? What do you want to be? What do you want to do? What do you want to accomplish? She goes, I don't know. I don't know. And then her boyfriend, who was with her and hanging all over her, I may say, which may be part of her problem of being able to make any decision, said, well, well, you really liked that women's studies course, didn't you? And she goes, yeah, that was fun. I said, great, signed the paper. You're now a women's studies major. And I did what probably every other advisor had done with her. It was just, she wouldn't make a choice. She would not decide. She just figured she'd spend eight semesters and leave. Um, That's not good decision making. And so what we have today is the two verses in Joshua that I'm sure uh, you knew I was headed to. Let us read the word of God together. And I'm in Joshua 24, verses 14 and 15. And this is the word of our living God. Joshua, speaking to the assembled nation, says, Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household... How many of you have that as a plaque or a poster or even a a door knocker on the front door? How many of you have this in your house? It is one of the great confessions of the faith, is it not? But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So here we are. Um, What I'd like to do this morning is look at five words from our two verses. And I'm going to do them in increasing order of frequency. Word number one is used a single time, and that is fear. In American culture, fear is considered weak, is considered bad, is considered um, unmanly. A real man says, I'm not afraid of anything. Well, that's not courage. Courage is, by definition, in spite of the fear, you stand up and do what is necessary. That's the mark of a courageous man. Um, What I want to do is, uh, there's a really fun app on the web where you can type in a whole bunch of words and give them a frequency, and it makes a cute little cloud like that. And when you are trying to understand a biblical word, the, the word we have here is yare in Hebrew, And it's fun to look at the way the translators have converted that word into English across Scripture. Um, Fear is obviously the dominant one, but we have awe, honor, astonishment, dread, um, reverence, 
Uh, this is the word picture, the word cloud, that the experts in the language have said this, this Hebrew word means this in English. It, it actually has two meanings in Scripture. And Professor Robert Stimple of Westminster Seminary says, if you look at the verses in the NIV, you'll see that the word reverence is used in some cases instead of fear. And this is good reason for this in translation because there are two kinds of fear that appear in the Bible. That's brought out in Exodus 20, verse 20. You remember the backstory? Israel has now come up to Mount Sinai. The clouds, the thunder, the darkness have come, and God is speaking. And the people of Israel say, hey, Moses, you go talk to him. And then you talk to us. We, we don't want any part of that. And Moses says to the people, um... Do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The word is used twice and it's used in the positive and negative way. We might translate it, do not be scared. God has come to test you so the reverence of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The first time we see this word in Scripture is in Genesis right after Adam has eaten the fruit. And he's hiding in the garden, and God says, why were you hiding? And Adam says, because I was scared, because I was afraid of you. Perhaps the best example of it being used in the positive sense is in Isaiah 11, describing the coming Messiah, where it says, a shoot will come from the stump of Jesse, from his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. Now, the Messiah is not some kind of horror movie buff who just loves that tingly, scared sensation of boo. He is a person who delights in that awe and reverence and humble obedience and fear and honor of the true God, the creator God our master and our Lord. In Proverbs, we're told the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and of knowledge, Proverbs 1, 9 and 15. We show our fear, according to Scripture, by keeping his commands, hearkening to his voice, and worship, Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 6, 1 Samuel 12, and other places. Now, this is hard for Americans. We, our, our democratic roots... And our democratic ideals say all men are created equal. Every man puts his pants on one, one leg at a time. I don't need to revere any person, any man. And, and we kind of get that chip on our shoulder kind of thing. I think of uh, Mark Twain's great a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court where he skewers the idea of royalty and that some people are born superior to other people. But we all in America do have our idols, don't we? They have a TV show called American Idol. People that we revere, we honor, we respect. Donna and I have uh, good friends, uh, Glenn and Bev. Glenn is a regional director for the University Christian Fellowship. And Bev is a vivacious chatterbox blonde who studied English and literature in college and her all-time favorite author in the, in the universe is Madeline Lingle, A Wrinkle in Time and, and other great stories. Well, uh, Ms. Lingle, of course, was a large supporter of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship and Christian Outreach, and there was a large fundraiser dinner in New York City, and our friends were going, and Glenn pulled a few strings so that they were seated at Madeline Lingle's table. And he kept it a surprise. He kept it a secret. And the story is both, both of them have affirmed this to us, that they show up and they're meeting everybody in the big uh, 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 dining hall and they get to their table and they sit down and Bev is meeting everybody and she looks up and it's Madeline Lingle sitting across the table. It's, it's Madeline Lingle. And this blonde, vivacious chatterbox was, in the British term, gobsmacked. She just sat there. And she says, my mind froze. 
All I could think was, that's Madeline Langle. And she, all those questions she wanted to ask about the books and this part of the plot and that part and the creative spirit and spark. And she just sat there for the whole night. That's Madeline Lingle. That's fear. That's awe. That's reverence. And we Americans do that pretty well. Second word, choose. Kind of, it's used twice in our scripture. Uh, choose now. Choose this day whom you will serve. And this, after all, is the point of the whole exercise. This is the point of Joshua's call. People face a choice. The ultimate choice in this life, who will you serve? It's not a question of if you will serve. Everybody serves something or someone. Everybody has a core organizing principle in their life. My troubled academic advisee, core principle was, I'm not going to make any decision, ever. And that was how she organized her life. I don't think it worked very well for her. But we all serve something. Jesus put this choice so clearly in Matthew 7. He said, look, you can build your house on a rock and it will stand the storms and, and gales of life, or you can build your house on sand and it's going to crumble at the first sign of trouble. Choice is yours. And Joshua is presenting the exact same choice. It is a fact that young people in our society, perhaps more than, than well, certainly more than my generation, want lives that have meaning, lives that have a purpose, much more important than career or where they're going to live or what they're going to do. They want their lives to have significance, to have meaning, to have a point of being on this earth. They have understood that he who wins the rat race has just been proven to be the biggest rat. And they have rejected the bumper sticker that reads, he who dies with the most toys wins. They want purpose and a center and a, a focus to their lives. Friends, when we communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ, we must find a way to present it as the good news it is, that it is the only sure rock-like center upon which you can organize your being. It is the most significant choice you can make as a human. Jim Elliott, of course, was a, a martyred missionary to South American Indians, and his most famous statement was, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. When we speak of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, we got eternity on the table. It is eternal matters. You don't get any more significant than that. Jesus stands and says, make your choice. Do you want a life of meaning and purpose and security and peace with God, or do you want something else? And all these something else's are flawed at best. That leads us to our third word that's used three times in the text, gods, with a lowercase g. It's used three times, and what I find just stunning and also revelatory in my own life is after 40 years of wandering in the desert and years of military conquest in the promised land, these rascals still got idols from Egypt packed in with the sleeping bags and the other bits of luggage. They've toted them around that long, and Joshua is saying, if you're making this choice, get rid of that stuff. We Americans think not in general terms of idols and, and little statues and things, although I did find it interesting that the VA, the Veterans Administration, will provide a, a tombstone, of course, for any vet who needs one. And they have a list of recognized religious symbols that you may select to be on your tombstone. So there are crosses and menorahs and, and so on. But there is also um, the pagan pentacle or pentagram from Wicca. You can get a Thor's hammer if you happen to be a Nordic believer. Or you could get the Druid Awen as an official tombstone emblem from the VA. So paganism is alive and well and out there. Most Americans don't think in those kinds of terms, though. We're sort of spiritually agnostic as a culture these days. Um, so what do we organize our lives around? What are the 
convenient common idols or organizing principles for life? I found a marvelous Pew Foundation survey from 2017. They got a whole bunch of Americans together and gave them a big long list of things and said, rate these things on the amount of satisfaction they bring to your life. And then they published um, those that said are a great deal of satisfaction, the, the top 10, the, the, the numero unos, the things that many, many people say bring satisfaction to their lives. And then being Pew, they organized them into seven different categories uh, based on the religiosity of the responses. And I just love the names they came up with. They're, they're a bit of whimsy here. Group number one are the Sunday stalwarts. Look around the room. I think most of us would fall into this. The Sunday stalwarts. Then there are the God and country believers. There are the diversely devout a whole bunch of different things in that. There are the relaxed religious. There's the spiritually awake, the religion resistors. And at the other end of the spectrum, we have the solidly secular. So we got the Sunday stalwarts to the solidly secular. And I love the alliteration. My sister Susie sells, she sells, and so on and so forth. What I did is I went through and I took the top five from each of those seven groups. And when you lay them out side by side, there is an amazing commonality. There are two things mentioned in the top five by all seven groups. You know what they are? What would you think? Money? No. Family. Family made the top five for all seven groups. Number two, I found a bit surprising, being in the outdoors creation. Those two made the top five in all seven categories. Coming in at number three, we have uh, friends and pets. Um, okay, uh, six out of the seven had friends and pets. So this I found interesting. The religion resistors didn't put friends in the top five, but they put their pets there. Their pets are more significant than their friends, and the God and country believers and the spiritually awake listed the pets ahead of their friends in the top five. I, I find that odd and peculiar, but so we are as Americans. Family, creation, friends, and pets. That is a core commonality Americans say brings significance and meaning to my life. Those could be gods around which we organize our lives. Word number four, occurring four times in our text, is the Lord, Yahweh. Um, and this is just a hoot. Is it Yahweh or is it Jehovah? Have you ever wondered about this? It turns out scholars have a whole separate word to describe this one word. Well, Yahweh is in Scripture more than 6,200 times. And it is the Hebrew word, if we transliterate the letters, Y-H-W-H. By tradition... A Jewish reader so concerned about the commandment not to take the Lord's name in vain, when they got to a verse that had this word in it, the Tetragrammaton, they would substitute the Hebrew word Adonai, which means Lord. And they would say Lord, or in some cases they would just say the name. Out of reverence for the name of God. Other translations followed this. So when they translated it into to Greek, when they translated it into Latin, they used the Greek and Latin word for Lord when they translated Y-H-W-H. Until the Reformation. And the Reformation, you know, all, you got all those German guys running around and the, the Dutch and the, the Northern European Scandinavian types. And here I always think of the, the nursery rhyme or whatever it is. My name is Jan Janssen. I live in Wisconsin. I work in a lumberyard there. And 
when you take the, the vowels, and, or sorry, the consonants, and you do that uh, Scandinavian German Y's for J's and V's for W's, what do you get? You get Yehovah instead of Yahweh, or Jehovah instead of Yahweh. It's the same word, it just depends on what accent you got when you want to say it. And the reformers are actually to blame with all that Germanic yas and verks and so on and so forth. So that's the mystery of the tetragrammaton. What's odd is Hebrew nouns only have three consonants in them. So um, this has four, and that's what makes it odd, and that's why they have a special name for it, the tetragrammaton. It is interesting that HWH is the word for to be or I am. And so when God reveals himself to Moses and says, I am that I am sent you, we think it's somehow it's related to that, but we don't really know. God told Moses, this is my name. And when you bring it over into English, you can say either Yahweh or Jehovah. It's the same four consonants, just depending if you're one of them Yon Yonsons from Wisconsin or not. The point is, this is the one true creator God, master of the universe. He who made heaven and earth and things under the earth. He who deigned how history will unroll. This is the God we serve. This is our Lord. This is our master. This is what we want to decide to base our lives on. And finally, number five, the word for serve. Serve occurs seven times in two verses here. It is a big word. It is a monster word. In Hebrew, it's abad. And I want to look at another word cloud here. If you type in the English translations and how many times they translate it, this, that, or the serve is obviously the dominant translation. But it includes labor, worship, worshipers, do, perform, labor, work, cultivate. It's, it's a huge word. It is a monster word. And it incorporates what it means to serve and to worship our God. The English translations range from serve to uh, enslaved, I see up there, and bondage, and perform, and work. This is a very large word, and it's something we all need to be aware of. What is it that we are serving in our lives? Is it family, the outdoors, friends, pets? What's the organizing principle? What's the center of your life? What's bringing significance and meaning to your life? Serving God takes all of us. The Hebrew in 14 says, serve God in truth and in sincerity. The NIV translates that as faithfully. It takes all we have. Look at the word picture. Look at the word cloud. This is not some happenstance. This is not some... Uh, innocuous, on-the-side sort of thing. This is a core principle of our lives. It takes all we have to accomplish this. So what? What does this challenge of Joshua to Israel from thousands of years ago mean for us in Grove City in 2019? Fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Let's unroll those words in reverse order. Joshua is saying we will all serve gods, lowercase g, or the one true creator God. We organize our lives around something. Even the world's biggest slacker has as an organizing principle, I want to avoid any kind of work. The challenge he throws down to Israel and so on to us since it's included in Scripture is precisely this. Make that choice a conscious one. Do a return on investment. 
who, what, where, why, and when will bring the most joy and satisfaction and meaning to your life, it is service to the Creator God who has ordained our very step and has created us to be in His image and to have fellowship with Him and enjoy Him forever. Make that the conscious choice. Once that choice is made, make it stick. Dig in, grab on, possess the choice. Serving God is not like buying an insurance policy and throwing it in the desk drawer. Perform it, serve it, work it. As a dance instructor said, shake it like you mean it. That's what service to God is. It takes everything we have. The Lord, Yahweh or Jehovah, we choose to serve God, the creator of heaven and earth. My, my study, NIV Bible, has two paragraphs in the preface, in the introduction, on how they chose to translate Yahweh and all of its, its uh, cognates, its combination forms. And we see Lord, Lord Almighty, Sovereign Lord, God Almighty, the Lord, the Lord Almighty. Do you get the idea what Lewis was after in the Chronicles of Narnia? He's not a tame lion, this God that we serve. He is the Lord. He is the Lord God Almighty. We have a choice to serve other gods, and our family, ha- our uh, culture has this shared sense of purpose out of family, creation, friends, and pets. God put us into family. He looked at his creature and said, it is not good for them to be alone. And he made them too. And he established the family. And from the family, he organized them into tribes and nations so that we could have community. And he set down laws for how that community should function. Laws such as uh, honor your parents, do not murder, do not steal, do not lie, do not covet your neighbor's possessions. We saw in the book of Joshua, he set up the six cities of refuge so that when sin happened, there was a a righteous and, and logical way to deal with it. And what he's saying is family is good, friends are good, creation is good, but they are all flawed now because of the sin that is within us all. And if you choose to organize your lives around a broken, flawed core, you're on the sand. You do not have the permanence of the one true God. And it's a choice we all make. Build your house, organize your life on the rock, build it on something other, which is flawed and broken and twisted. I I am struck that these were the gifts of the Creator God to us, His creation. Family, community and friends, um, the creation to enjoy its beauty and its purpose. And I guess even pets. We we are to uh, be stewards over the animals of the earth. I guess that includes Fido, but I, I don't quite get it in American culture. But those were gifts of our loving, gracious God. Do not confuse the gifts with the giver of the gifts. One is perfect and eternal. The other is imperfect and flawed. Choose this day. This is the single most important decision of your life. Much more important of whether you'll have the COVID vaccine shot of what your career will be, of who you will marry, where you will live, what you will do. This is the determining decision of our lives. And it's a decision that needs to be made today and reaffirmed today and reestablished today. Because as, as the command for us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, you know the problem with the living sacrifice? It keeps crawling off the altar. We need to remind ourselves again and again, this is the purpose of our lives. This is its center. And the the one word, fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. We Americans don't think in terms of revering and being in awe and fear of a person. And I think that angst is captured up in Bart Millard's chorus, uh, the Mercy Me Band, I can only imagine. When speaking of showing up in heaven, 
The chorus goes, surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? To my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. I can only imagine. My own belief is that when we appear before God Almighty and see him face to face, our response is going to be, that's God, I am not. My appropriate position is face down in the dirt. And then our loving, perfect advocate, Jesus, will lift us up. Say, I've taken care of all of that. And let us stand before the throne of grace. Amen. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Amen. Thank you, Dave. This is a, a good moment for us to, uh, to take stock of what our hearts have been choosing. And um, I want to invite those of you who maybe have found yourself pulling away or maybe resistant or maybe never made the choice to consider a moment here um, about choosing God, if you feel that leading of the Holy Spirit, to either make a first-time commitment or to recommit yourselves um, to choosing God and the way of Jesus Christ. Let's take a moment to pray. Loving God, in Christ you have shown that you love the world. And by the gift of faith through your Holy Spirit and by grace, you invite us to come to know you through Christ. Some of us here this morning have known you, have been walking with you, and we are grateful to be among those to know we are your children. Some of us started walking with you and then got tired or lost our way. And this morning, those of us would like to recommit ourselves to knowing, to following, to loving you. And for some of us, God, this is a first time opportunity. For those that are choosing you for the first time today, we give thanks. And we pray that as their brothers and sisters in Christ, we would be faithful in walking alongside and encouraging them in the journey ahead. Thank you for Jesus who has made this way for us. It's in his name we pray, amen. As we close worship today, I invite you to stand. Um, we're gonna actually say a prayer together as our affirmation about choosing. Um, and it is about a declaration of choosing God. So if it's something you feel that you can say, um, honestly and truthfully, I invite you to say it with me. Um, but I do invite all of you who are able to stand. Let us pray together. God, you have chosen me, and in Christ have extended an invitation for me to become your child. With your help, I choose to love you with all my heart. With your help, I choose to love you with all my mind. With your help, I choose to love you with all my soul. And with your help, I choose to love you with all my strength. God, by your Holy Spirit, help me to choose you today and every day so that I may live a life that honors and glorifies you. Amen.
Please remain standing for our closing hymn. And if any of you did make a first time commitment to Christ this morning, we'd love to hear from you. Um, I'll be remaining up front and be happy to pray with you or talk about next steps. Thank you. Let's receive the benediction. Now to him who is able to do far more than we can think or imagine, to him be glory in his church, both now and forevermore, for we have decided to follow him. Amen. We are dismissed.